So, uh, my name is Kenny Vistani. I'm a developer evangelist at Neo4j. Uh, let's get a quick round of hands. If you're a meetup regular, you've come to our meetups in the past, uh, raise your hand. If you're new, raise your hand. So a lot of new people, that's great. So we are the uh, San Francisco GraphDB meetup group. Uh, we are, so Neo4j is based in San Mateo, um, but we do a lot of events here in San Francisco. This is where a majority of the action is happening. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I will uh, get started. Uh, so the talk today is about uh, uncovering invisible relationships using a graph database. So a quick overview. Uh, so the agenda, I'm going to set some expectations on what we'll be going over today. Uh, we'll be doing a quick overview of Neo4j. Uh, and then I'm going to show you how to use Neo4j to map uh, the relationship between content and demand, as well as going over a few customer quotes and stories. So Neo4j is a graph database, and it's used uh, in many uh, different domains uh, and industries. Uh, just a few examples here, we have HR and recruiting, healthcare and science, telcos, manufacturing and logistics, energy, finance, and of course, the most important one, web and social. So what is Neo4j typically used for? So uh, social networks is a huge one, right? You have people and you have relationships between people. Uh, Twitter, for example, you can follow somebody. Uh, on Facebook, you can be friends with someone. Uh, so these are all explicit relationships that Neo4j uh, can graph and map out and. Uh, allow you to query it in a way that gives you a, a lot of power over using your relational database. So network impact analysis. Uh, so let's uh, assume that you have a set of servers or applications mapping the dependencies between them to understand impacts somewhere or a single point of failure. Uh, so a popular one is route finding. Uh, Show me the route between point A and point B. It's a very simple example. Here we have the, the London tube, uh, but Google Maps is a, a, another good example. Recommendations. So uh, a user who viewed X also viewed Y. It's a classic example. Uh, if you've used Amazon.com, uh, you'll see a little, uh, this little, uh, uh, widget sometimes at the bottom of a page if you're viewing a product, which shows you some other things you may be interested in. Uh, for example, Doctor Who. So logistics uh, and parcel routing. So you want to deliver a parcel to a destination. How does it get there? It has to go through a few routing centers. Uh, so Neo4j is great for that as well. Access control. Uh, so you have a set of applications, uh, web services, and you want to uh, impose a layer of security on top of them for certain users. So you have users that are mapped uh, to services which they can access, uh, and there's certain chains of dependencies and access control, inheriting permissions. And so uh, graph is a, a good natural medium to be able to model that. So one of my favorites, uh, fraud analysis. Uh, so uh, analyzing uh, first party bank fraud from looking at patterns within the graph actual visual patterns. An example of this is you have a set of uh, I synthetic identities that are created from a few real identities. And so certain pieces of information are shared among a ring uh, in first party bank fraud. And so a graph can be used to understand that pattern and to analyze the risk to see, uh, to notify uh, certain responsible parties that they should investigate. So these are just a few examples of uh, what you can use Neo4j to do. Uh, so let's get into uh, the next part of the talk, which is graphing content demand. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and set some expectations again. So I'm gonna describe the problem and some challenges in doing this. Uh, I'm gonna answer a few questions. So uh, what are invisible relationships, which is the title of this talk. So what the heck are those things? Uh, so how do you infer relationships using a graph data model? How do you graph the demand for social content, which is a big one? And how do you distribute valuable content where it is most demanded? Essentially creating an economy for content. 
So let me describe some problems and challenges that you might run into. So there is all this digital content out there, and uh, people don't know that it exists. So you might find yourself sometimes on the internet, uh, maybe you use a service, you said, I have a set of interests, and you're being presented with content, recommended content. Well, sometimes it, you're just, you're, you're, you can find yourself going through all of these posts and not finding really something that you like. So there, there is content out there for you, like content that you will find interesting. It's just that it's hard to find because there's just so much data out there uh, and it's getting so complex. Uh, so every day there's, there's, people write blog posts every day on interesting things. And so it's, there's definitely that piece of content out there for you. It's just really tough to find because there's not a lot of good ways to be able to map demand content. So that's what I want to show you how to do using Neo4j. So some development challenges. Uh, if you're using a relational database, uh, recommendation engines are hard to develop and time consuming. Uh, so the challenge here is that uh, data modeling on relational databases isn't fun. Uh, and, and that comes from personal experience. Uh, going from having to design uh, enterprise resource diagrams and, and uh, table schemas is, is a pain in the butt. Uh, and so it's not a lot of fun, but when I went to start using Neo4j to do graph data modeling, which was just like a epiphany for me, I was like, wow, this is a lot of fun. Uh, and it was even more fun to realize that, okay, now I can just query these chains to be able to do things that are really, really difficult using a relational database. So in essence, it's boring, it's hard to remember, and it's also very hard to articulate to colleagues. Relational tables. Uh, so the solution, uh, Neo4j doesn't uh, just give you an awesome open source uh, graph database. It also provides you with a new way of thinking, uh, which is really important. So there's not just the product, the technology. That's not just the innovation. The innovation here is that you have a whole new way of thinking about data and connected data and how data is related to other pieces of data. And that is something that's sorely needed today uh, in a way that's, uh, I guess, more interesting for people to use. And so our community, you'll, you'll find lots of uh, tweets on Twitter saying how much people enjoy using uh, our database to do data modeling. Uh, and that, that happens every day and I, and I love seeing it. And, and I had that moment too. I, I remember when I first started using Neo4j to solve a problem, and I was just like, wow, this, this is the future. And I tweeted it, and Emma retweeted it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so it's, it's easy, it's fun, and you don't need to be a 10x developer to be able to build freaking awesome apps. So here's a, an example of a relational schema. It's pretty ugly. Uh, you can't really look at this and understand the relationships between these tables, I mean, sure you have some properties, you have some foreign key relationships, you have some primary key, uh, but it's kind of tough to see exactly from just one image what is related to what. So we use a property graph data model, which uh, allows you to explicitly set these relationships and represent that in a way that's really easy to understand and articulate. So here, for example, uh, it's like a movie domain. So we have Tom Hanks and Hugo Weaving, Tom Hanks acted in Cloud Atlas with Hugo Weaving, and then Hugo Weaving also acted in The Matrix, which was directed by Lana Wachowski. So that's really easy to articulate. Um, it's very natural. And so data, the data modeling process is very natural as well. Uh, so that's why it's a lot of fun. So what are, what are these things called invisible relationships? So. Uh, Here's just a little example graph. We, we have behaviors, we have content, we have interests, we have people, we have brands. Now, what are these things having to do with each other? And, and so that's really where the invisible relationships come in. You have a set of explicit relationships that maps these pieces of content together, but there's an opportunity to, to make inferences to be able to generate recommendations, which uh, you wouldn't have been able to do using a relational database. Or you could, just it would be very difficult. So let's go over some examples of, of these explicit relationships. Uh, so for example, you have people who follow people, um, you have people who share content, and you have people who like content, and you have people who have interests. So this is key uh, to this example, is that you have these people who have explicitly stated, I am interested in X, Y, Z. Uh, 
Now, a lot of the times people really don't know what pieces of content they, they really want. It may be completely unrelated to their interests, but it may still be interesting to them based off of their collective experience. So what are some examples of invisible relationships in a social network? So uh, the famous classic example is you have a friend of a friend. So uh, you have a network of people, and you can have a friend in common with somebody else. So a friend of a friend, friend relationship, so an invisible relationship, uh, which is easy to do in Neo4j. You have people who are demanding content. Now, how do you how do you predict that? Is is what I'm going to be answering today. An actual example using Cipher, which is our query language, uh, and also you have content which supplies interests, and I'll be going over that. So, how do you infer relationships using a graph data model? So, the goal is to best understand how to deliver highly valuable content to a social network. You have all this content out there which may or may not be uh, valuable to the people within that network. So it's not a uh, one size fits all approach. It's a how do I distribute out this piece of content to where it's gonna be most demanded and valuable. So that's the problem that, uh, that I'm gonna be showing you today and a problem that is really still existing out there in the uh, web application space, mobile space, uh, and social networks in general. So the idea here is that you want to make connections where value can be quantified uh, and quantized and measured. And by using a graph database, that's, that's quite simple because you have these relationships which are explicit and have types between pieces of content. So here, and setting up the example, uh, let's assume that we have uh, users who, who can share content. So let's just say this is Twitter because it's easy. Uh, so in Twitter, you have users who uh, share content via retweets, right? Or just posting it and they get retweeted. So sharing it with other users is an act of, I think that the people who follow me who have similar interests will find this interesting, right? That's the idea here. So you have these users who share content and they also have the set of interests. Pretty simple. Now, the invisible relationships is, uh, is seen here. So here you can see that a content supplies an interest, and a, uh, both on top and bottom. Uh, and we can infer that because uh, we know that a user who shared a, con a piece of content has a set of interests. Even though the content may not be related to the interest, it's still interesting based off of the user's collective experience. And that will make more sense in a second. So the big question then is, how do you graph the demand for social content? So going back to the example. Now here's an uh, example graph. This is in the Neo4j 2.0 browser. And so I'm going to set this up best I can. If you can't read it all the way in the back, I apologize. So here we have a set of people who are blue. So we have Emil, we have Chris, we have Michaela, we have Lars, we have myself, we have Amanda, and we have Vixen, which are all my colleagues. And they have a set of interests. So we can see that uh, Emil is interested in big data. He's also interested in venture capital, uh, NoSQL, and startups. Uh, so we also see that I'm interested in data mining. I'm interested in startups. I'm interested in machine learning and technology. Uh, we see that Amanda shares some of those interests, but she's, she's also an avid video game player, um, which she doesn't share with anybody else uh, in this graph. Uh, that's where this dangling node out here is. Uh, and so Vixit, I'll just go over everybody because it will make sense when we go to the demo. So Vixit is interested in predictive analytics. Uh, he's interested in databases, interested in NoSQL, uh, and interested in big data. And these yellow bubbles are content. So the content has a title. So let's just say it's an article. And I've pre-populated this example. Uh, and the titles are fairly long, and they don't really fit in the graph. So that's why I have integers on them. And they've shared these pieces of content. So I'm going to jump to my demo real quick. I'm just going to speak loud, because I can't type. And <laughs> Uh, play with Neo4j at the same time. 
All right, so here's the Neo4j browser. No, that's not it. Uh, one second. Okay. Zoom in. Can everyone see that okay? Back of the room, thumbs up. Great. Okay, so this is a Neo4j 2.0 browser. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I will do a quick little intro here. So it's a web-based, uh, it's essentially a web-based shell. So you're interacting with the database via Cypher queries, which is our declarative uh, query language. And that's, that's done here through our little console. Um, you have history, so after you put in a few queries and executed them, you can go up and down and look at your history. It's very useful. Um, you can favorite queries uh, using the star up there on the uh, top right. Uh, and on the left, you have some informative panels. Uh, so you can see, kind of introspect and see what's in the database. Uh, you have a set of node labels, relationship types, and property keys. Uh, and then in the favorites tab, you can actually go and look and see what um, queries you've previously saved. Uh, and also you can introspect the database even more. Uh, I'd like to use this example with what is related and how. And so that <coughs> query tells us that we have these Let's zoom in a little bit more. We see that users can be interested uh, in interests. We, can, we see that users can share pieces of content and that content supplies interests. So now I'm going to just clear the database, set up the demo, go into my favorites. And so then I'm going to set up the example here, which is our graph that I showed you an image of earlier. Sorry. Okay. So if I scroll down, this is the simple setup script. So you can see that I've mapped the connections between people using Cypher. And Cypher is a very clever uh, query language, which <coughs> is uh, akin to ASCII art. Uh, you have nodes, which are in parentheses. You have relationships that are in square brackets. And you have arrows, which describe the direction of the relationship. And then I have my pieces of content. And I'm just going to go over those real quick so it makes sense. Uh, so we have content one, and I, I picked these kind of not at random, but I went on uh, Get Prismatic, which is kind of a neat app. And they have uh, tags related to pieces of content. I kind of just inherited that. And so here, our, our first piece of content is analyst boxes. Only realistic uh, option is to sell the company. Uh, and then we have uh, content number two is decision-making trees and machine learning resources for R. Uh, number three, we have NoSQL job trends uh, February 2014. Uh, four, a massive market opportunity awaits in analyzing the Internet of Things. Five is uh, Meet Factual, the self-fashioned force multiplier for big data. And number six, creepy website shows how much uh, Facebook knows about you. And so these uh, pieces of content all have uh, certain, um, they're not actually mapped to interest, and that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to infer the relationships based off of what people are interested and what they've shared. So each of these people have shared a piece of content, which I've set up here. And now we want to create the relationships that don't, e don't exist. And so let me go ahead and run this. Okay, so that sets it up. Let's look at the graph. I'm going to run a simple Cypher query here, which returns us everything in the graph. And it gives us a nice, pretty D3JS visualization here, um, which is exactly that image I showed you in the slides. Uh, it's a lot of fun to play with data. If you haven't done it, it's quite a rush. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, so we have interests, we have content, we have users. Now that's what our, our graph looks like. Uh, so now let's go to the second step. So let's uncover the invisible relationships between uh, content and interests. So let's pull up that Cypher query and go over it. Uh, so I'm just going to explain what the Cypher query does. Uh, so based off of the graph we've already created uh, here at the top, uh, the point of this is to uncover those invisible relationships between content and interests by creating a supplies relationship. 
So here on line two, you have content, which is shared by a user. And you want to match that pattern in the database. And then you have uh, users who are interested in interests, which again is explicit. Now we're saying, okay, now with these things and the aggregate of interests as the weight, build a relationship between all of the content and the interests that the people have who have shared pieces of content and to aggregate those into a weight on the relationship, which qualifies it. Because we want to understand, too, how much a piece of content potentially is related to an interest in our network. So if I run that, it goes and it creates all of these uh, relationships. So here, these are all new relationships. I just created them. And we have uh, here, and orange or red is the interest. And then we have yellow pieces of content. And now you can see 136 has a whole bunch of uh, tags related to it. And each one of these relationships have a weight based off of the amount of times that people in the network had shared it with a certain set of relationships. So we've aggregated that and put it into the relationship. So from there, the next step. Is it question? Oh, yes. Can you do that same query without creating the relationships explicitly? The same query without explicitly creating the relationships? No. Okay. Because they don't exist, right? So you can, you can return back pieces of content. I think it might be useful for illustration here of what I'm doing. So uh, now I'm running the first part of that query without creating anything. And let's just return back content title, which is a property, interest dot title. And then let's return back the weight that we aggregated. So here you see, let me zoom out a bit, all those uh, pieces of content that I went over earlier. And you see that we they're related to these interests which people have, and that there's a weight associated with it. And where that weight comes from, if we remove that width line, we can look at this completely denormalized, where we have pieces of content, we have users with names, and then we have uh, the user set of interests. I'm just going to completely denormalize here, which is the title. So that query returns back. You see a lot of redundancy here. Uh, and this is where I'm aggregating and, and, and getting that sum and putting it on the relationship. So if, if we order by the interest title, let's give that an alias. Sorry, as. So here we have these interests which are related to these articles, and so that's where the count's coming from, just normalizing it into a graph structure. Does that make sense? So that's, that's fairly important for doing the recommendations later. All right, so now that we've done that, uh, we can go and we can generate recommendations. So I'm going to pull that up. Actually, let's go ahead and look at the whole graph now, which has evolved since we have added in uh, supplies relationships. So it's much more connected. And now let's go ahead and do some recommendations. So provide a recommendation based on demand. So let's just iterate through the people that we know. So here we have Vixit, who has a set of interests. And those interests are supplied by pieces of content which he has not shared, because we don't want to give him content that he's already shared. And so that's what this little where clause does, where it says where not user shared content. And then to return back the content title, and then to sum the weights of the relationships together, and then to order by that descending. So we see that we have a little recommendation here that Vixit probably would be interested, based off of his interests and, and his uh, behavior on the network, on NoSQL uh, job trends in February 2014. So if we go back and we match Vixit's 
interests. Aim, fix it. Interested in and we return. Just return everything. So we can see that fix it likes uh, he's interested in NoSQL databases, big data, predictive analytics. Pretty in line with that piece of content. It's a small data set, um, but it is what Vixit would, based off of his history of what he's both shared and what he's interested in, would want to read. Um, and that gets better with more data. So as you add more data, uh, you're going to get better recommendations. So let's try Lars, who's our VP of Ops at Neo, uh, and see. Let's see what Lars is interested in. So Lars is interested in startups. He's interested in predictive analytics. Uh, he's interested in NoSQL and interested in venture capital. Uh, so based off of these four interests, uh, we can recommend to Lars what he sh would be most likely to want to read. And Aptly, he probably would want to read about a massive market opportunity awaits in analyzing the Internet of Things, uh, which is kind of actually cool because I, I didn't kind of like backwards pick these examples. I actually just kind of randomly picked them out. Uh, and so it actually worked pretty well based <laughs> off of what I kind of knew about people. Uh, and so I was pretty happy with it. So here again, you have the weight, which is a sum of the relationships weights, uh, and then they're ordered. And so in the UI, you would you would show uh, you might want to show the top result, and then after they've read that one, the next one. Hey, yeah. Can you please tell me what I should read tonight? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's let's go through. Let's see what Emil's interested in. Emil's our, our CEO and fearless leader, by the way, um, and he's interested in startups. He's interested in big data. He's interested in venture capital, as well as NoSQL, among many other things. What should Emil read? NoSQL job trends, uh, February 2014. Uh, Sounds about right. right. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, all right, so, uh, so that's the demo. I'm going to jump back to some slides. I'm actually going to open it up for questions now. I have some more stuff that I'm going to talk about, but let's break it up a little bit. So I'll open up the floor for questions on this example. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Name, and then also I need to repeat your question for the camera. Yeah, thank you. How does it uh, scale uh, with the number of nodes? How does Neo4j scale? Yeah, for this type of query. So it, it scales well for these types of queries. Um, you're going to want, it's going to be based off of your use case. This use case, you're going to have a lot of uh, concerns that you're going to want to manage you, if you were to import data on a regular basis. But because this model that I've developed here is really just doing mutating operations uh, using Cypher, it's actually quite performant because you're not having to analyze data too much. You're just kind of creating relationships between things. And then as it scales, since these relationships have already been created, as a large part of the graph, you're only updating parts of the graph that don't have those invisible relationships yet. So it does scale well. Yes? How would you integrate another dimension? Like, you know, how recent was the share or how recent is the content and using that uh, as a way for them? So adding in a time dimension, right? Yeah, yeah so uh, I recently did a talk on building a graph-based analytics platform which uses models time appropriately. Uh, and yes, it would be quite easy to put that in here. Uh, you, after all, your calendar, you would have a unique day with a timestamp, and that day could be related to a month, a year. Um, you could have weeks that are connected to days, and from there, you can, at different scales, aggregate to understand what behavior looks like at those scales, uh, and then you can integrate that into this because you then have a single day node or a single aggregate node, which would be a week, and you would just map that to a piece of the content uh, based off of what behavioral pattern you come up with. Does that make sense? Cool. Is there a way to building a string of reference? So it's essentially defined at the edge, the, the weight of the edge? 
Yeah, so for which edge? Let's say between a user and a piece of content, right? Like, let's say on a scale of one to five, they rated five versus. So ratings that the user has inputted? Yeah, so uh, you could then use that as a multiplier. Uh, you probably want to use some, a mathematical function that makes sense for this domain and recommendations. Uh, so maybe some machine learning, and it's been done. We have GraphGIS, which are, are we have these, this project, which our developer evangelists do, which shows you active examples uh, on a website using our database. And one of the examples uh, is uh, recommending movies using K nearest neighbor uh, and cosine similarity. And that's kind of a similar thing to what you're talking about. A user rates a piece of content, and then it does some clustering algorithm to figure out how to modify the edges based off of the recommendation. And you can store that right into the relationship. Just because a graph database, our graph database, allows you to store key values in any of the entities, relationships, and nodes. Any other questions? Yeah, that? So that example you just gave, uh, that's an outside of Cypher? That it's ex complex enough that it's probably done outside. It's not using Cypher, right? Did, so I'm just going to repeat the question for the camera. So you, you asked that if this example was done outside of Cypher? Yeah. That meaning that the example you just gave, um, it was that using Cypher or maybe some other um, method? It's, it's using 100% Cypher. Yeah. So the, I created a sample data set using Cypher, and then from there I did the analysis using Cypher. In the back. Can that just have properties just like a nodes can? Yes, right. So in, in a property graph data model, you can give key values to, to any entity, so relationships and nodes. And those data types can be an integer, it can be a float, it can be uh, any of the Java integrated data types. Can it be hierarchical uh, properties? Sorry, repeat Can it be hierarchical uh, properties? Hierarchical properties? Yeah. So in a graph database, to model hierarchies, you would just use nodes and relationships. Um, and from there, you would use Cypher to sniff out those hierarchies based off of whatever your uh, use case was, scenario. Yeah, you probably wouldn't want it to, to put, I guess I, it would be missing out on the opportunity to use a graph database to model these types of things if you put it into a property. But you can create maps, which kind of like JSON map, put it into a property. Any other questions? Yes? How uh, language bindings do you support? Uh, so we support a bunch of language bindings. I'll actually, in some of the last slides, I'll, I'll go over that. All right. So let's continue on. I'm just going to switch back to. <coughs> okay. So we went over all that. Okay. And then again, I pointed out, right, content may have nothing to do with interest that it supplies. Uh, that's okay because people uh, don't know what they want sometimes. Okay, so I went over the Lars example a lot. Okay, the power of graph databases. So I'm going to conclude in the next couple slides by kind of going going over some of the more of the general guidelines and, and what graph databases are really doing uh, within the uh, market right now and how how we're really uh, finding customers that are first of all have huge big problems and and they need a graph database have needed a graph database for a long time, um, and so they've turned to us. Uh, so, graph databases provide a means to draw valuable inferences at very large scales, uh, which is really important and hard to do in a relational database. Um, so, in a relational database, you're doing joins, and to be able to traverse through data, you have to do dynamic joins, which is a real pain in the butt. And so, graph databases give you a, a declarative uh, query language to be able to traverse this data, and that's just built in. Uh, so graph databases are a great tool to deliver richer experiences through personalized online interactions and content discovery. Uh, and that's based off of being able to uh, analyze certain patterns of behavior over time and then to connect those aggregates to uh, other nodes to be able to generate these recommendations based off of uh, traversals. And so the invisible relationships in a social network are the ones that haven't been made yet. So. They're out there, it's just figuring out where they are and then creating them. And then from there, it offers a whole new layer of opportunity 
because from there you're able to create another layer of thin relationships. And doing this over and over again allows you to draw tremendous inferences, which are valuable. So there is also a huge opportunity to connect people with content that they demand. And so that is kind of, I think, what is key to Medium. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd add that in there, is that that's exactly what they're trying to solve. So kudos to them, and kudos to them for looking to us to help them do that. Uh, so let's go over some uh, few customer quotes, and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, so uh, GameSys is one of our customers. They are based in the UK. They're an online gambling company. Uh, and so here's a quote from Toby O'Rourke, uh, O'Rourke, uh, technical architect at GameSys. Uh, Using Neo4j allowed us to focus on the important parts of the project, getting the domain model right, extracting novel insights from the data, and delivering business value quickly. So Glassdoor, who's uh, familiar with Glassdoor.com? Raise your hand. So a uh, pretty popular website, lots of data. Uh, so what they do is they're essentially, they provide insight information, they have an information economy that people can use to do research on, on uh, competitive career salaries in a market. Uh, so, so you have these people who join the website and they discreetly and anonymously offer up some information and they're given some information in return. Uh, and so they use, they use our database to model these connections. Um, and so the quote here from Glassdoor, which is just, uh, I guess, a, a quote from the company. I don't have a name. Uh, but the, uh, the Neo4j graph database proved the perfect fit for integrating Facebook into uh, the Glassdoor community. As a result, we were able to provide a better experience for our uh, members and provide them with real job recommendations. So they wanted to do recommendations to people based off of a certain set of features. And uh, most recently, which is really exciting, is uh, Crunchbase upgraded their uh, services to 2.0, uh, which is powered by Neo4j. And so I just took a quote right off their blog post about their business graph where they mentioned us. Uh, and so the quote is from Matt Kaufman, who's the president of Crunchbase. Creating the business graph requires a technology platform that can expand and evolve with an ever-changing data set. Crunchbase 2.0 is built on a graph database designed for applications where you can't neatly predict what data you might add down the road or what queries you might throw at the data. It's a really powerful quote. So that, that is all I have for you today. I, I wanna thank you for, for coming uh, and listening to my talk. Uh, I'll be around for questions afterwards. Also, I will open up the floor again for questions and Maybe some of the other Neo4j employees that are here will want to answer some questions as well. But I should make one final announcement. Smart people, come work with me. Uh, so we're looking for awesome data scientists to join the NeoGraph. Uh, so if you are a data scientist and are interested in working with us and solving really big problems, uh, talk to myself or any of the other Neo employees here, Amel. Uh, and if you're a Neo employee, raise your hand. Now you know who they are. Great, thank you guys. Get in touch with me if you have questions and uh, I will open it up for, you can, you can clap. <laughs>
you can find all of, uh, well, a lot of our use cases. We have a new website which really does a great job uh, telling you all about uh, our customers and their stories and uh, their examples. You can also go to, to uh, gist.neo4j.org to find uh, community contributed example use cases uh, using our GraphGist project, which again is a little mini website application that uses our database to prove certain things using Cypher. There is a number of customers that are in that bio domain. In fact, there's even a port of Neo4j called Bio4j. Right, Bio4j, <laughs> yeah. Bio4j, yeah. it does some specialized stuff in that domain, so yeah. The, 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 the guys in that area really like Neo4j. Makes sense, right? Life is connected. Do you have <coughs> any method to, uh, to discover s disconnected, I have some biological question, which is discovering some disconnected uh, subgraphs or clustered nodes? Is there any way with neo to do that? Yeah, there are ways to do it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and it's dependent on your scenario, your use case. So there's really no general rule to do that, but using, yes, you can do clustering and you can use Cypher to do clustering, but you'll probably want to do post-processing, which is to export it to some format to do some type of graph analytics. Uh, you can use, that's, uh, I use Gephi to do some cool stuff with visualization as well as some graph analytics and clustering and node coloring. So any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I was curious. You, you <clears throat> there was a question here about uh, whether you could actually do some of these kinds of queries without actually creating these uh, extra nodes and links. And what I'm wondering about is, uh, if you have uh, some analysis you want to do, you want to get a result out of it, and then you kind of want to throw a lot of this stuff away. You don't want to keep it around in your database. I assume there's some way to tag your nodes and links and then, and then clean them out afterwards, but that seems kind of ugly. So it actually would be quite easy to solve Can using. The so the question was that can you, so after you've created these inference relationships, these you've actually made implicit relationships explicit. Uh, maybe you want to maintain your graph so you don't have all of these relationships laying out there that you don't need anymore. Uh, and so the answer is yes, you can tag those uh, uh, relationships in many different ways. You can tag nodes to those relationships uh, based off of another node. Um, and, and you can also put properties on those relationships, which you can specify delete by a certain date or based off the set criteria, go and delete these relationships and you can select on that. So, yes? How does Neo4j handle concurrent reads and writes? Concurrent reads and writes. And so Neo4j handles it very well because that's what it does. So okay. you, you have concurrent reads and writes. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah, we so actually, last year though, we, we were going to put out a new product called NullDB that only does writes. Okay. It doesn't do any reads. And that was <laughs> really, really fast for writing. Really fast. Yeah. Super fast. Yes, yeah, so it does. It does it. out of it. Yeah, so it's, uh, our, our database is fully acid. Uh, so that is something that you'll probably be interested in doing transactions and rolling back transactions. And we have a REST API that integrates. So. Primary mode for, for most people these days using Cypher is through our REST API. Um, and we actually we have a transactional endpoint which allows you to post transactions to an endpoint to, uh, to commit them or to, to roll them back. It's just some other information. Any other questions? Yes. And there is security protocols around the database. Security protocols. So there's, there's not any built-in security protocols other than basic auth, um, which your, it's your responsibility to put it behind a firewall and to map it uh, in such a way that uh, it doesn't expose it to any uh, threats. Huh? Graphs are good for Graphs are, yeah, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem there. Yeah. Yeah, so, but two, access control is a, is a use case for graphs, but I think you're talking about more of like, in SQL, you have a set of servers that you have logins and credentials, and it has built-in access management. So we don't have that yet. Any other questions? Cool, well thank you guys, I really appreciate it. Uh, and then uh, if you have any other questions for the gang or you're really smart and you wanna work with us, uh, please come up and talk to me. Oh right, uh, yes, very important. Um, yeah, so if you go to neo4j.org forward slash drivers, you can find all the drivers that uh, we support. 
We support loads of drivers. They're written by our open source community mostly. Uh, and so just go to the website and if you actually have a question as to whether or not we support your driver, the answer is probably yes. Um, and there's uh, open source projects which have the client side drivers to be able to communicate with our uh, database. So with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>